welcome to Sunday morning at the Rock Church, wherever you are. If this is your first time to join us on Facebook or Instagram uh, or any other means, maybe it's archived and you're watching it a week or two or maybe a few hours. all of you to our service today and today is Mother's Day and we honor all of our mothers and I'm looking on the screen behind me and I'm seeing mothers all the mothers just wave a hand I'm looking at I'm looking at mothers on the screens of the building and uh, wherever you are give your mama a big hand clap right now husbands and children clap for your mama amen and uh, we are we are delighted to be able to come to you today and uh, we celebrate with you. Mothers are so, so important, not only for bringing us into the world, but the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. And in the health of an apostolic church, I don't even know if we could really place a value on the important role that mothers play in our congregation. And we celebrate. I, I want to do something right now. I know we're doing we're doing social media and today we've got Zoom going on for all of our church members. I would like all of the mothers to stand up if you can where you are. And if you got to move the computer or the screen, just stand up. I'm getting a good look at you right now. This is this is the this is virtual. I see Charity Emery. Charity, you're not the mama. Get your mama in there. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm looking. There's, there's Sister Deborah. Amen. There's Sister Madsen, Sister Vicki. There's Sister Susie. Amen. This, there's Sister Ramona. Good to see Sister Ramona. Amen. Fought COVID and won. Praise God. Amen. Frontline worker in the healthcare industry. I'm looking. Amen. Uh, I think I saw Sister Champlain. Oh, there's three mamas together. Look at the Horton mamas right there. Amen. There's my mom. Mom, I'll see you in a little bit after church. She got dressed up. Look at her. I mean, that's the best looking mama up there. I'm looking at her right there. And there's, I see Sister Hibbler. Amen. So one more time, give mama a big hand right where you are. Amen. I see Sister Diane Brown. Uh, we're glad to see her healthy and doing better. Amen. I know she's been battling sickness. And, and uh, by way of announcement, as you know, coming up normally, we would be preparing for graduation service. But how do you do graduation? Uh, I guess you can figure it out. But for us, we're more into being together. So we're going to postpone our graduation service until we can be together. But we would like to gather your information. And today will be the last day we make this announcement. So if you would get all of that to the office this week, whatever you're graduating from this year, a high school, college, vocational school, master's degree, doctor's level, certificate programs, whatever it may be, uh, if you would please get that into the office, 916-689-7625, 689-ROCK. And then also, don't forget this week, join every night. Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday for Faith Life, previously known as Faith in Crisis. But we made a shift. We're coming out of crisis and we're headed to awakening. I really believe that there is going to be an apostolic revival that shakes our world, shakes our nation. I'm already hearing so many good reports. Already churches have begun to open uh, in capacity situations and already good reports are coming back. And uh, stay tuned. Everything is changing from week to week. And we're giving updates of how we're going to be doing each Sunday and each Tuesday night here locally. But we want to keep you involved and stay close. So pay attention to our announcements throughout the week. And this week, every night, will be Faith Life at 7 p.m. And tonight, tonight, you don't want to miss on this Mother's Day evening, we have one of our our special friends, mentors, and one of Bishop's sons in the gospel, one of Nanny's sons in the gospel. On Mother's Day, one of her boys is going to be a special guest tonight, Pastor B.J. Wilmoth from Redlands, California, who is one of our favorite men of God around here, is going to be a guest speaker tonight. You don't want to miss that at 6.30. So that's going to be a great time. 
We're going to be connecting with him from Southern California through technology. It's going to be a great time. So you don't want to miss that. If you've never experienced the ministry of, of Brother B.J. Wilmoth, you need to hear it because this is a man that experienced personally a virus that affected his life forever. It was known as polio. And this man has a unique perspective about victory and overcoming. And tonight, he's going to challenge the church. I spoke with him at length this week. God's going to do something very great for this church tonight. And I encourage you, wherever you are, pay attention and tune in tonight at 6.30. going to be a great night. Well, it is Mother's Day. And we honor all of you and love you. And uh, I know that there is, there is something special about Mother's Day at the Rock Church. And uh, normally about this time, Sister uh, Rebecca Salters, we affectionately call her Bebby. Bebby and Beth would normally kick me off the stage and the women would take over. And uh, they usually have a presentation, but due to all of the social distancing and issues that we have had to wrestle through, uh, it proved to be impossible. But we want to say a big thank you to them for their laborious work every year so they get the year off this this mother's day uh, but this church was founded with the heavy influence of strong mothers and that comes from the first lady the founding pastor's wife of this church we affectionately call her nanny and uh, nanny is here this morning nanny would you stand up and uh, if you love Nanny, give her a big wave right there on the screen. Nanny, I'll look at him right there. We love this woman of God. She's a powerful woman of faith. Look at him. They're waving at you. They see you. And uh, I can't think of anybody that understands good godly women than this couple, Nate and Mary Wilson. Now, for all of you out there in radio, internet land, he's Dr. Nathaniel J. Wilson. But this is Poppy and Nanny to us here at home. We love Brother and Sister Wilson. And on this Mother's Day, Nanny, who's your favorite preacher? Oh, without a doubt, my husband right here. <laughs> so on Mother's Day, can you think of anybody, anybody better than you'd rather hear than him? Right here. He's the best. Poppy, we want you to do what you feel in the Holy Ghost. We love you. Happy Mother's Day. Thank you, Pastor Young. Praise the Lord, everybody. What a great time we are having here on Mother's Day, and we are glad that you are a part of it. Um, Mother's Day is not originally a biblical holiday, but it kind of feels like it is. Amen. And... Uh, Brother Young introduced Sister Wilson. That's the mother of my children, the mother of many other people's children, the grandmother of many, 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 many other people's children, and um, has been as successful as anybody I know in the mother business, and also the very successful grandmother of children and beyond her own uh, biological grandchildren, many, many other grandchildren. So uh, Sister Wilson, as a representative of all of the mothers of the Rock Church and all of the great mothers that are tuned in and all of the great mothers of the world, would you just come up here and sit down over there uh, on the platform, it just make me feel a whole lot better to have a, uh, a mother up here with me, particularly you, while I'm preaching this morning. Amen. My, my text this morning is Judges chapter 5. And verse 7. And I, I've got to tell you that I, I love this scripture. And I'll try to explain a little bit later. But Judges 5 and 7 reads like this. The inhabitants of the villages ceased. 
they ceased in Israel until that I, Deborah, arose. That I arose a mother in Israel. The inhabitants of the villages ceased. They ceased in Israel until that I, Deborah, arose. That I arose a mother in Israel. So today, as you would expect on Mother's Day, I'm going to preach to all of you mothers and uh, hopefully be a blessing to you. However, uh, you will know, and all of you that attend church regularly already know that almost anything that's preached that's biblical resonates with all of us one way or another. And so my trust is today that this will resonate not only with mothers, but also with uh, fathers and young people and single adults that are not parents and, um, and any other category that I may have just missed saying. Praise God. So all of you mothers, we love you. We appreciate you. We are proud of you. And we are glad on this Mother's Day to recognize you and to acknowledge the greatness and the importance of mothers. Amen. I want to preach to you for a little while today on the subject of mothers, the agony and the ecstasy. Mothers, the agony and the ecstasy. So now that we've said Happy Mother's Day and hopefully though your husbands or children cannot take you to a restaurant, I guess, maybe somewhere, I don't know, it's changing back pretty quickly. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, in very gentle terms, I want to tell you I'm just sick and tired of this mess. And um, we're going to get back to church and uh, it won't be long. Pastor's working very diligently. A lot of very positive things are happening. And my personal opinion is it won't be very long till we'll all be right back here in the house of God. Not a matter of months, uh, but a matter of just uh, days. So uh, whenever that, it's up to the county now, they tell us, and, uh, uh, and the county people are eager to get things going back the way they're supposed to. And so uh, we're very excited about that taking place. Uh, and probably it'll start with certain restraints, but we'll work our way back. One good thing about it is, is as we prove that you can have church in a sanctuary such as this and still maintain social distancing and all of the other protocols that go along with an attempt to keep from spreading the virus, as we prove that, if this ever happens again, all of you authorities in government, hear me, if this ever happens again, this will set a precedent to prove that we can do social distancing uh, and have church at the same time. At least in our sanctuary, we can. So uh, when this gets back, let's please note that we were able to do that as good as Walmart or as good as any of the other stores. And somebody said, um, uh, surely we don't think that those little viruses know the difference between a Home Depot and a church. And so uh, you're no more protected at a Home Depot than you are in a church. So hopefully as we work through this, uh, we will find ways, not only churches, but everybody, government and everybody else, will discover ways that should we have another round of this someday, we will be able to operate better than we have in this one because in this one, Everybody approached it with an ignorance of what it was going to take. And uh, therefore, there's ex uh, 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 excess caution uh, to keep uh, a great plague from sweeping across the land. And I will say, a great plague can sweep across the land in our day and has done in modern times. And so um, uh, these cautions, now that it's kind of ex post facto and you're looking back, and you're saying, well, some of those weren't necessary. We may know that next time, but we didn't know that this time. So, um, so let's just work to get this thing going back the way it was. Amen. So my title, um, uh, 
I think is after considerable contemplation and meditation about this, I think probably when it comes to mothers, the, the title, the agony, and the ecstasy is just about, maybe completely, but just about um, as good a description of motherhood as could be found because it's broad enough to encompass all kinds of experiences, but all of them fall within the context of this kind of statement, the agony and the ecstasy. In fact, from the moment that motherhood becomes a reality, that is, at the birth of a baby, immediately the first thing above all others that takes place with a mother is the agony. And then a few seconds, or for some of you minutes, or for some of you hours later, after the agony comes the ecstasy. And uh, the agony of childbirth, the Bible tells us, and you mothers could tell us, is soon forgotten, or at least left in the distant parts of the mind. And the ecstasy uh, of the wonder that no doctor yet has got over. And if you talk to doctors, they would tell you that doctors that deliver babies, that the wonder of birth, the wonder of life in a human being, the mystery of it all um, is also always an awesome thing, no matter how many uh, births they have witnessed. Uh, but when that baby comes, then the wonder of that baby um, never ceases. It is, it is an amazing thing. And uh, there is nothing on earth that we can describe that is quite like a mother and her baby. There is a relationship. There is an affiliation. There is an intimacy. There is a tenderness. There is a purity that, uh, bonds that newborn baby and that mother and uh, from the very time of birth. Of course, um, and there's nothing more beautiful than to watch a mother with her new baby as a baby laughs and learns and so forth. Uh, but with that said, that is only the beginning. And from that point, uh, there are all kinds of experiences of agony and ecstasy. The first accident of the baby, especially if it is a serious accident or as a child, the agony, the wonder, is he or she, my baby, going to come out of this without permanent scars or even if it's a head injury, are they gonna come out okay? The, um, the ecstasy, of watching them excel in little things. That people can get excited about a baby being able to finally stand up and grab the edge of a coffee table and take two or three or four steps. And pictures go out and arms go up and people are screaming and hollering at something that is so small. But it is ecstasy for those who are close to that baby. And so lives depend upon mothers in so many ways. There are so many ways in life uh, that, that everything revolves so strongly around mothers. Now, if it's Father's Day, we would talk about fathers, but some of the things I've said here about mothers is not true of fathers. Fathers take second place in a number of those things. And, um, and there, there is no, no substitute for mothers in the life of a child. I recently read a list of uh, the 75 great, of 75 great women in history. When I read that list, I kind of chuckled because on the list there were women who had done great things for their people and great things for their countries. There were women who had made great medical discoveries that still impact all of us today in a positive way. Women who won Nobel Prizes for what they had uh, done and what they discovered and what they developed. There are great women of literature all the way back. One of the greatest women in the deal was a woman who was 
None of us would even know her, probably. Most of us wouldn't, but um, uh, all the way back before Christ, all the way back to the days of Plato and so forth. A woman, uh, a writer that wrote things that was, they said in some ways, beyond what Plato could write in the way that she articulated things. Um, and then there were, of course, later women who have written great literature also. There were included women who were great military leaders who saved their countries. Joan of Arc in France, by, before she was 20 years old, was a military leader and, um, and uh, was a great uh, savior to the French people in their battle in those hundreds of years ago with the English and um, eventually was executed, which added just more mystery to her life and to what she was. And there were other great military leaders in life, governmental leaders. Uh, these people were all included. But then there was also uh, Catherine Hepburn and Marilyn Monroe and Madonna and others that are similar to that, which are only there because our particular society um, has a skewed definition of greatness. To them, greatness is fame. Fame equates to greatness. But but fame is not greatness. They are two different things completely and totally. And uh, fame, there can be notorious people who are, uh, their notoriety makes, them, makes people know them. But being famous is not the same as being great. And so the question came to me while I was meditating about these things is uh, what in God's opinion, in God's understanding, what is true feminine greatness and motherhood greatness. Uh, and so one of the things that we know without getting into a great discussion of that is that God defines greatness always as to its beauty and greatness against the backdrop of eternity and time. And so it's not just are you known in the flash of your moment. For example, one of the people I just named on the uh, 75 great women that they put down was an actress named Catherine Hepburn. And uh, she was a very, very famous actress. But there are people, un probably most of the people under the sound of my voice don't know who she is. And so that's not the kind of greatness we're talking about. That's fame or notoriety. But when we talk about the greatness that God would consider great, it is always against the, the velvet canvas, the black velvet Kansas, uh, canvas that makes the person stand out, and that canvas is uh, eternity. And so what is greatness in the light of, of, of history that transforms, that has world impact, that by world impact, I don't only mean in your lifetime as a mother, but that lives on, what, what is it that makes that? So when I looked at all of that and I thought about mothers and I tried to do several categorizations here of how to do that, of, of elderly mothers whose uh, children are grown and long gone, even children are grown and long gone, and then of, of middle-aged mothers and of young mothers. And so it's a little bit hard to categorize them like that. But I thought about Anna uh, in the Bible. Her, the first mention of her is she was... 84 years old and this woman's children were already long raised uh, and the Bible talks about her in uh, Luke chapter 2 verse 36 like this it says talks about her as being the one which departed not from the temple but served God with fastings and prayers night and day so here's this old 84 year old mother who has long past raising children, but she is not just whiling away her time or, or just sitting lonely somewhere, but she is spending her time in ministry in the temple. At the same time, there's an old fellow there. They're not husband and wife, but he's there. His name is Simeon. He was also almost uh, the same age, and just as she was, a devout person, and she was, he was there waiting for the Messiah. God, he felt like God spoke to him, that the, he was going to see the Messiah before he died. Here comes Joseph and Mary walking down the aisle one day to the temple, 
uh, when Jesus was eight days old and Simeon sees this baby and something triggers inside of him and he stops and takes the baby and talks to the parents and prophesies to them and prophesies to the mother what that baby is going to become. I've thought about what Mary must have felt like while all that was going on. And she, here she is a young mother, probably at that point still a, young, a teenager. And she is holding this baby and this ancient prophet is standing there prophesying that her baby will be great, but that her heart will be, be pierced, the agony and the ecstasy. And so when he says her baby will be great and her baby will do great things, it's an ecstasy. But then when he says, but your heart will be pierced and he, he will also be pierced, uh, uh, then it is the agony and the foreboding that the rest of his life, she's got this on her. Uh, that's what the prophet told me. And so while Simeon is doing all of that, uh, the Bible says of Anna and she coming in that instant stopped and saw all that was going on. And then she began to speak and she spake of him to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. She stopped and saw the baby. She didn't just talk to Mary and Joseph. She turned and she started talking to everybody that was within listening distance in the temple and said, all of you who are looking for uh, the redemption that is coming in Jerusalem through the Messiah, right here, come here. And so you know it must have been an ecstatic moment for the entire congregation of people that was there that day because of this old mother in Israel and because of her uh, being tuned into the things of God. So old age has nothing to do with being used of God. It just may change the way that one uh, is used of God. Another example that I thought of that I preached about uh, a number of years ago now, two couple decades ago, I guess, um, is, is animals, mother animals. And um, the mother animals that I preached about then, that is worthy of mention against this, uh, this morning. And then it wasn't on Mother's Day, so this is Mother's Day. Um, the mothers are found in the book of 1 Samuel, and they are mother cows. And in the book of 1 Samuel, you'll find uh, some of the greatest people in the Bible. The three, Sam, uh, the book of 1 Samuel is primarily about Samuel himself. Uh, and then secondly, it is about Saul. And then thirdly, it's about David. So the last judge and the greatest judge in scripture is the first part of that book. And then when you get to chapter nine and 10, uh, Saul becomes anointed as king and he is the main uh, character in the next few chapters of that book. And then when you get on down the line to chapter 16 or 17, then it transfers to David and David is the primary character in the book. And so it's all about people who became great, but they all have a characteristic in common. And the characteristic that they find in common is, is the mother cows. The story of the mother cows tells something that happens to everybody that has true greatness. So even though I'm preaching about mother cows, uh, this applies to everybody regardless of gender, weight, size, shape, looks, age, or anything else. This applies to all of us. Uh, the story is, as you would maybe remember in 1 Samuel chapter Six is that Israel went to war with the Philistines. Uh, uh, Israel was losing in the battle to the Philistines. In the process of losing in the battle, they brought the Ark of the Covenant, which was a box which signified the glory of God and, and uh, formerly set in the tabernacle of Moses. They still actually had this box. It was uh, some years later. And so they thought if they took the box that represented the presence of God with them into the battlefield, that God would be with them and he would give them the victory. They were desperate. They were looking for anything that they could find. So they took the box into battle. It did not help them. The Philistines uh, uh, defeated them anyway. And at the same time, captured the Ark of the Covenant and at the same time took it back to Philistia, and set it in their cities in, in the temple, as you remember the story, with the god Dagon. 
And uh, so the people came into the temple where Dagon, the idol, was there the next morning. There's a lot of stuff about Dagon. We won't go into all that. But they came in the next morning, and Dagon was fallen over next to the Ark of the Covenant. So they set Dagon back up. Uh, they were very superstitious people, and so they thought this is not good. They set him back up. They came back the next morning, and Dagon was fallen over, and he was broken. His hands were broken off. And um, they, so they recognized now they were terrified because they said the God of Israel is with this box, this Ark of the Covenant, and we've got to do something uh, to get this curse off of us. And then there came a plague on them brought by mice, which is like the bubonic plague. Probably was a very similar thing. And it started just killing people across the land. Uh, and it was, I don't know, I doubt if it was everywhere in the world. It wasn't a pandemic, but it was an epidemic. And so they were being, uh, they were dying everywhere. And they said, we've got to get this ark out of here, this box. How do we get it out? They all, they all got together and thought about it. And uh, somebody said, let's take the ark and let's put it on a new cart and let's send it back to Israel. But we will know if God is bringing this epidemic on us. We will, this will be the sign. We will know it's God bringing this epidemic upon us if we, if we hook it to some cows, not to bulls, but to cows. And cows that have babies, mother cows. And we hook it to cows that have babies. And then we take the babies and we lock them up back here in Philistia. And then we put the, car, the, uh, the ark on the cart and we send the cows back to Israel. If the cows will leave their babies instead of turning around and coming back to their babies, if they will leave their babies and take this cart and ark back to Israel, then we know that this is why we have a curse on us because it's causing the cows to violate the biological heartbeat of a mother and leave their calves behind to do the will of God and to do ministry, to carry the ark back to where it belongs. That's doing ministry. These cows, these dumb animals. Uh, and so they hook the cows up to the cart and they put the ark on the cart and they aim them for Israel. They turn them loose and start them down the road. And the Bible is very clear that the cows did not turn around. In fact, and this is the heart-rending part of the story, the Bible says the cows went back to Israel, and I'm quoting the Bible, lowing as they went. Lowing as they went. We're talking about the agony and the ecstasy of mothers. And so these mothers are in agony. They are lowing in, in, in cow language. They are weeping in cow language. They are moaning, lamenting the fact, where's my babies? I'm leaving them behind. But they had the compulsion in them that said, I have to do this uh, because this is the will of God. I've got to do the will of God. That story becomes applied to the story of Samuel's birth. That story becomes applied to Saul and that story becomes applied to Samuel. And that little innocuous story becomes the seedbed from which an understanding of the book of 1 Samuel is derived. So let's go look at it for just a moment. We're talking about mothers, the agony and the ecstasy. And right now I'm talking about young mothers and the agony and the ecstasy. And so the Bible, uh, book of 1 Samuel opens up in chapter 1 with the story about Hannah, who is a young mother but not yet a mother. So she's a young woman. She lives in the house with her husband, Elkanan, and she also is there. This is before the giving um, um, of some of the strictures that were required and that were followed later. And so there's also in the house Penina. And, and so Penina has children, Hannah has none, and um, Penina never lets her forget it and speaks condescendingly to her. And the Bible lets us know it vexes her and upsets her. 
And so she is praying, God, give me a child. She goes to the temple every year with her husband and um, at Shiloh, they go to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. And when they get there, uh, she is praying. She is seeking God. She is in such deep intercession that she is kind of laying uh, halfway down. And she is weeping. And Eli, the priest, comes by and sees her there and stops and says, young lady, uh, he, he thinks she's drunk because she acts like it. And he says, you shouldn't be drunk here in the house of the Lord. And she says, I, I am not drunk. She said, I, I, and she explains to him that she, she wants to have a child. Eli says, be it unto thee, and walks on. She goes home, and before long, she's expecting her baby. Her agony is turned to ecstasy. She has this baby, but she makes a covenant when she has this baby. And this young mother, who has had no children, who has suffered the agony of those days of being barren was something that was considered to be uh, a curse upon you and you weren't considered to be worth anything. And so she has the baby that she seeks, but she takes the baby and against the love and pull of all the biological ligatures that attach mother to baby and everything that is involved in that that is beyond human language to be able to articulate. She takes her baby and she says, Lord, you have given uh, my baby to me. And now, Lord, I am going to give my baby back to you. And so like the cows going from Philistia back to Israel, she takes her baby when he is old enough and when he is weaned. And she takes him and they go to the house of the Lord again. And when she gets there this year, she brings a little offering. But she doesn't need to bring lamb because she's going to offer something else. And she offers her child. The priest is happy to get the child and takes the child into the home. Think about what this mother is feeling as she goes back home having ambitions and dreams and hopes for her baby and now seeing them all dashed as she gives them to the Lord. What kind of discipline is that? And what kind of thinking is that? And what kind of faith is that that says I will give my child to the Lord? I will tell you as a former pastor and now a bishop, there's more than one person, people in this church, people in churches I pastored in the past, people I preach to in meetings across the country, who I know and I notice that they are careful that their, their children don't get too close to the preacher. Uh, they love their child, but they, those that have been around us very long know that we don't think anything in the world holds the importance of our children being used of God but I have watched people who have intentionally obstructed my influence or my wife's or now pastors on their kids. I have watched them when they have gone against my advice over the years. I've watched them when they have kept them away from me or now pastor. Uh, I've watched them not only with their children, but where they guide their husbands not to get too close because they know how we would try to influence their husband. All of this is not done because they're mean. It's because they have an immature and a truncated view of life and that they see the garnering of material things or some kind of um, uh, earthly success through which mama can vicariously or daddy live through that child uh, to watch them do things that they could never accomplish or felt like they never had the chance to accomplish. Uh, all of this in spite of the fact that uh, in the Bible, the firstborn always belong to the Lord and all the children are the heritage of the Lord and all of them should be given to God. I watch people who later in life, now maybe 10 years later, we look back and their children have not become anything what they had dreamed that they wanted their child to become because in their dream they had no idea what it took to cause that to come. They had no idea all the working pieces that gets people to where they are and that the only way, and if you disagree today, that's your right. This is America, but you have a right to be wrong. The only way 
for your child to do the things that carry the most weight, to be judged against the backdrop of eternity and the worth of things that have ultimate concern and not little chattering, tinkling things that just go like a thin uh, stream of water uh, babbling against the rocks. And, uh, and it's a pretty sound for the present, but in the bigger picture, uh, their life becomes something that is shallow and uh, it becomes characterized and dominated by the routinization of everyday life and, and, and they, they never see the bigger picture. They're never exposed to the bigger picture. They're never, they're never thrown out there where the mom and the dad have to feel the rending when that boy or that girl steps into doing things that are going to require uh, a separation from them physically and all that goes along with that and the areas of life that are protected because people are carnal this story of Hannah uh, is the exact opposite of that it's at the crossroads there are parents right now while children are still young the way you teach them what you say to them this was the reason for our creation of Hope Corps when we were sitting down, writing out the plans of how Hope Corps would work, working out the details, and then when the school started, figuring out how the educational component fit in with that. All of that, but there are people, they don't want their children in Hope Corps. They don't want them influenced to the things of God. They, don't, they, they would turn the cart of God's presence around and leave it in Philistia rather than to take it home. And so here we see some of the agony and some of the ecstasy that has to do uh, with, with mothers. And so uh, I think now that was a young mother, that was a mother with a child for the first time who later went ahead and had three more sons and some daughters or whatever. But uh, I also think of, of, of middle-aged mothers who get caught in the web of things that's bigger than they are and, and, and don't see anybody taking charge in a way that will bring liberty and freedom and guarantee safety for their children in the future. And that has to do with my text this morning. The inhabitants of the villages ceased. They ceased in Israel until that I, Deborah, arose. That I arose a mother in Israel, a mother. Deborah was obviously a mother, meaning she had biological children of her own. But it means more than that. It also means, it also means when we use the phrase mother in Israel, that she was a mother that rose up and the spirit of motherhood, the protectionism, the nurturing, the tenderness, and also the correction that took uh, place was was far beyond the doors of her own little house until she became what we would call today uh, a tremendous leader in the, in the town and then at first maybe even in a village because she talks about the and I'll mention this a little bit in a minute and explain it but the inhabitants of the villages ceased so that's her first observation that the villages not the cities but the villages ceased indicating that she was very closely aware of the village and maybe she was raised in a village and she had her little uh, home in the village and then she began to see the villages ceasing and she began to act as a woman and as a mother and as a leader and quit waiting on everybody else to do it until she said, I, Deborah, arose, that I arose a mother in Israel. So a mother can have greatness uh, in more than one way. One way they have greatness is by their exploits, which set an example for their children. So are your children, this goes for daddies too, are your children going to remember your exploits as failures that you have to apologize for for the rest of your life because they found out about them and that forever negates or at least greatly blunts the impact of your advice on their lives? Or are the exploits of your life going to be positive? And when those kids look back, they say, look what my mama was like. Look what my mama did. Here's what my mama did in that situation. Here's the tenacity and strength that my mama showed 
uh, under pressure. And here's the courage that my mama showed when other people wouldn't respond or wouldn't do anything. My mama stood up to this. And so there's, that's, that's the positive exploit. So, um, and so that's them personally doing it. And then there's also the greatness that comes from carefully raising and nurturing their children. So some of the nurturing is by her own example of her actions and some of her nurturing is by her simply taking care and putting the right things in that child and not putting depression and not putting despondency and not putting uh, constant worry and not putting um, anger and not putting abuse and not put, all of that stuff transfers to that child and comes out in a hundred different ways as it gets older. But this is a mother who doesn't do that. And so in the Bible, the story of Deborah, this is Mother's Day, it's a holiday, so let's preach a little bit. Can you say amen? And so in the Bible, uh, the story of Deborah comes after the reign of Ehud. I don't have time to retell the whole story of Ehud. He's the guy that slipped in, killed the fat king that was uh, keeping them in bondage, jumped out through a window, raised Israel, and <clears throat> defeated the enemy, and brought peace to Israel for many years. But eventually, the Bible says, when Ehud was dead, then it was just a short time until the people, without leadership, uh, fell under Jabin, the king of Canaan. And he had a captain named Sisera. And they fell under great bondage. Uh, Sisera, the captain of the host, had under him 900 chariots of iron. In those days, that would be a big deal because their iron was a scarce commodity. And to have the facilities to actually melt it and mold iron into things that could be used for warfare and chariots that were made of iron was a really big deal. For 20 years, he had oppressed Israel. And then, after those 20 years, Deborah had grown up. And Deborah... The mother in Israel was a prophetess, which means an anointed woman. Doesn't mean she always went around prophesying, although she did prophesy, but it meant that she was an anointed woman. How much does the world need an anointed woman? That you can see the anointing by the beauty that exudes from her and through her face, no matter where she's at, and by her godly appearance that is in itself a magnetic Power. And this woman had all of that. The Bible says she judged Israel after Ehud. She dwelt under a palm tree between Ramah and Bethel. And in those days, the Bible said, travelers used uh, the back trails to keep from getting robbed because everything was so dangerous that you couldn't use the highways, you could, the main roads, because, uh, because there were so many robbers on them. And the Bible also says, and I read it in my Text that villages were disappearing because of robbers who attacked whole villages and destroyed them, burned them to the ground and took all of the goods and, um, and kidnapped the people. That all kept happening, Deborah said, until in Ju Judges 5 and 7, until that I, Deborah, arose. Until that I, Deborah, arose. That I arose, a mother in Israel, and then the Bible, she wrote that. And then she said, then there was war in the gates. Has anybody ever seen mama on the war path? Well, when she gets on the war path in a good way, there is war in the gates. And I'll just tell you what, there are some times that women need to go to war in the gates in their own family, and they need to go to war in the gates with their own children. And some of you that have had teenagers or do have teenagers, fully understand the engagement that I'm talking about. And so sometimes it's because a spouse may be getting cold or compromising. Whatever it is, then was there war in the gates. When was there war in the gates? When I, Deborah, arose, a mother in Israel. She calls Barak, which is her equivalent of Sisera, Sisera which is the uh, general for the king that had him under domination. 
and Barak or Barak is, is Deborah's general. She calls him, she tells him, raise an army out of some of the tribes of 10,000 men and I will, feel, I will find a way to draw Sisera and his army to a certain place and you already be there and you can surprise him when he gets there. But the Bible says in Judges 4 and 8, Barak speaking, and Barak said unto her, if thou go with me, then I will go. But if you will not go with me, then I will not go. So here is this brave man. I don't want to make too much fun of Barak because he did win against 900 chariots of iron. But I do want to say there's sometimes a guy needs the woman. And the woman in certain situations has more courage in that given construct than does the man. And I imagine Deborah kind of breathed heavy and rolled her eyes and she said, okay, I'll go. But listen to what she said. Notwithstanding the journey which thou takest, talking to Barak, the journey to war, the journey which thou takest shall not be for thine honor, for the Lord shall sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. So when you get there, Barak, and people think in military terms, it's Barak and his army against Sisera and his army. She tells him, because you had to have me go with you, you will not be the one that takes Sisera down. A woman will take Sisera down. And so the battle is engaged. Barak and the men go. They meet the 900 chariots of iron. They, they are engaged in battle. Deborah says to Barak, Judges 4.14, up, for this is the day in which the Lord <clears throat> hath delivered Sisera into thine hand. Is not the Lord gone out before thee? She bucks him up. There's sometimes a man needs to be bucked up. He needs somebody to say, I'm with you. I believe in you. I'm standing with you. Look, if you don't have a good husband, then start thinking of what he would look like if, if he was perfect. And then start treating him like he is that. And when you start treating him like that, he finally gets a revelation of what he could be. And then he follows that track. Don't tell him I told you that secret. But that's the way that it works. You have to treat him that way. If you keep saying, well, brother so-and-so, he sure is a good dad to his kids, but you're just a dumbhead. And you're, that, no, 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 you're, you're a dumbhead with him. That's not the way, that's not the way that works. This is not the way that it, that it comes to pass. It comes to pass when you get the vision. It goes for your kids, it goes for yourself, and it goes for your husband. When you get the vision of your kids as they would be if they were ideal, and then that is the way you talk to them, and that is the way you treat them, and that's the way you teach them. When you get that vision of your husband, of that ideal, then you're, then you're shocked when he doesn't do what he's supposed to do. And instead of, instead of retaliating, you're like, I can't believe you did that because I know what you really are. Because if he ever reaches the image of God that he's supposed to be, then the closer he gets to that, the more he is what you see him in his idyllic, idealistic state. Does any of that make sense? Good, I'm glad everybody got that. And so, um, and so Barak and the men go, they meet him. Barak prevails, no man, the Bible says not even one man was left, uh, uh, but except Sisera and he is now missing. Where did he go? Well, Sisera, the head of the enemy army, fled, and he, and he was exhausted, and he was worn out, but he had got away, and he gets to the house of a woman named Jael, and Jael knows he could kill her, and so he goes into her house and says, give me drink, give me water, and let me rest a little bit, and if anybody asks for me, don't tell them that I'm here. And Jael doesn't give him water, she gives him milk. And she lays him down and, and gives him a cover and lays a cover over him and said, don't worry about anybody coming. And when uh, he finally goes to sleep, she takes a nail, very sharp on the end, undoubtedly, and a big hammer. And she places the nail very carefully. In fact, the Bible says she came very carefully 
to where he was. And she places a nail. If she messes up, she's dead. She places the nail right up to his temple, and she takes the big hammer, and she hits the nail, and then she hits it again and again and again, and she drives it all the way through his head into the ground. And so here is, here is a woman who is caught in a situation, whether you think it's cruel or don't think it's cruel, she's caught in a situation that she cannot escape. It was not of her own making. And so what is she going to do? Is she going to help the enemy to try to preserve her own life? Is she going to act with courage? Maybe she sees her babies in the back room and wonders what's going to happen to them, especially if this guy prevails in war, is able to get home and get back. What do I do? What about the people of the nation? I hold the future perhaps in my hands here. And so all the questions that people face are not easy to answer. And all the, faces, uh, all the questions that mothers face are not easy to answer. Then so she's in the agony of decision whether or not she can bring an ecstasy of victory to the entire nation. And so she drives the nail, she does the deed, and then she goes and finds somebody and tells them that this is what has happened. Then J.L., Eber's wife, uh, uh, took a nail of the tent and took a hammer in her hand and went softly unto him and smote the nail into his temples and fastened it to the ground. And then Barak arrives at the tent where Jael is, uh, and she shows him what is done. And with glee, Barak dis realizes that we have got victory. I don't think Barak cared, cared if it was a woman that did it or if it was he that did it. He's just glad to be alive. And so out of that, Deborah, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to be through here within the hour, and Deborah... <laughs> Everybody said, praise the Lord. Amen. <laughs> Amen. And so Deborah, what does she do? She's a mother in Israel. She's a married middle-aged woman. She is a leader. She is a prophetess. But now she stops and gets Barak and the two of them sit down and write a song. They write a song. You can read it in your Bible. And so she says, in thinking back over this victory and over the agony that she went through, of whether they could pull it off, she says in the song, Awake, awake, Deborah. Awake, awake. Utter a song. The Lord made me have dominion over the mighty. She says, Praise ye the Lord for the avenging of Israel when the people willingly offered themselves. She inspires others. She said, Blessed above women shall Jael, the wife of Eber the Kenite, be blessed. Shall she be above women in the tent because of her courage. Uh, courageous people, people that act, people that accomplish, people that do not let themselves get sidetracked into little personal uh, lust and desires, uh, but stays on track. And if they get off a little bit, they get back on and they stay on the track. Uh, and so she, she is now, she's inspired jail with courage. And, and so here she praises jail and says, blessed shall she be above women in the tent. Uh, but in all of this, as Deborah revels in the ecstasy, Deborah is a mother. And in the midst of that, she remembers a mother that is in agony. While she is in ecstasy, she remembers a mother in agony. And she says in her poem, the mother of Sisera, the foreign general that was killed, looked out a window and cried through the lattice, about her son Sisera. Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why tarry the wheels of his chariot? And then in her mind's eye, Deborah sees all this and she says, the ladies in waiting to Sisera's mother 
They respond to her and they say, have they not sped? Have they not divided the prey to every man a damsel or two? And to Sisera, your son, a prey of divers colors, meaning clothing, the spoils of war, of divers colors meet for the necks of them that take the spoil. Don't worry, mama, he's coming home, trying to assure the mother in agony. But how many mothers do we know today that they never came home? How many mothers had children in the military that they never came home? How many mothers today have children that have died and that deep in their heart, while we are celebrating and honoring our mothers, they have a broken place. They have a place where the pain never stops and the agony never ceases. Oh, over time, it may be a different little beat of pain, but it's always there. And so to you mothers today, whether your sons died as enemies whether your sons died as criminals. It's like the boy that was going to the chair, the man who was going to the electric chair. This really happened. He was with his mother in the last hours of his life. They were sitting there quiet. Nothing was being said for a few minutes. And finally, he looked at his mom and he said, Mom, whatever happened, to the little boy that I used to be. And so I'm sure that mother wondered the same thing. How many mistakes did I make? How many failures did I make? And that mother also may have known that she did not do what she should have done. So I wanna thank all of you mothers, godly mothers, strong mothers. I wanna thank you, Sister Wilson. I wanna thank you, Sister Young, I want to thank you, Rebecca, who have babies everywhere. I want to thank you, mothers that are here today under the sound of my voice. Godly people who are strong and who are doing in, incredible things on two fronts. One of them is in raising your children to be champions. And the other one is to do exploit yourself, improving yourself to become and to do. And this in turn also becomes a stimulus to your children to greatness because examples are always, almost always greater than our words. And so today I challenge you, every mother, I challenge you today. There are almost certainly mothers here listening that are not living for God. There's almost certainly mothers here that you may be one of the blacked out spots on the Zoom where you don't want anybody to see your face. You may have made sure your name's not on the black spot. You may have tuned in through YouTube or some other uh, way that does not divulge your identity or that you're here. You may be a backslidden mother that's made a lot of mistakes. You're embarrassed about them. You're caught in a web of illicit things that are destroying you. But I'm saying to you today, don't ever say never. It's never too late. It's never too late to get yourself back on the right road. You don't have to go make some big public announcement about it and about all the things, the mistakes you made. You just got to come home. You just got to realign with God, realign with those that realignment is demanded for things to move forward and let God touch your life. You mothers that have recognized today that maybe you are some of those that have subconsciously, you may not even thought of it, diverted your children away from commitment to God. People are afraid when they are under leadership that they see is radically committed to God, they come to a crossroads. Do I want to allow my children to go down that road? And I would say to you unequivocally, yes, because that is a road of blessing. 
That is a road of strength. That is a road of power for your children. And above all of that, that is a road to eternal life. Shall we pray? God, we thank you today for this. Even though it's a creation of man, it's a very worthy day to stop in recognition of what is that I can think of the most important thing on life on earth that has to do with human life. And that is our mothers. Bless those mothers today who are broken and have broken places in their hearts from hurts of those that once stepped on their toes and now have stepped on their hearts. Let reconciliation take place in families where there is division. Let courage come in families where everyone has been beat down and all their life they've been told to just be quiet and take it. When there's some things you shouldn't be quiet and take, you should stand up and say, I am supposed to be becoming as a woman or as a man, as the case may be. Help us and give us wisdom, God, in setting examples as well as verbal instruction to our children. Help us, dear God, in a changing world. Today you see our world, and when it comes out, it's going to be different than when we went in. But help us to also be different in that we face it with resilience and courage. And all the loneliness all of the hurt and the pain and all of the bewildered feelings about what do I do next and the sense of loss and the sense of disconnectedness. Let the balm of Gilead, our heavenly father who also knows how to nurture like a mother. Let your tenderness come to each of these today. Touch each household of those that are listening Touch each mother and each father and each child. Bring the only thing that is the ultimate balm. Bring the Spirit of the Lord into those homes and help them to cast out everything that's trite and worldly and carnal and lustful and sinful and secular that's of a negative fashion. Let our hearts be raised to you today. Let this be a banner day. Let this be an intersection with destiny day. Let this message not be diluted by the fact that it's coming mediated through technology. Let it come through pure and strong. Let it smack the heart, God, as though they're all right here. I believe you. I pray. In Jesus' name. I surrender all to you. to the Lord this morning. Everything I give to you. You've heard a word from the Lord this morning. Give your heart to him as they say.
to be the people so called to be. I pray that you strengthen you minister to every mother, especially I today. Let's make a commitment after hearing the word of God, Lord, to stand in the gap, to be the one that you have called us to be. Bless this mother. Strengthen this mother, those that are taking steps of faith today. Maybe they've been away from God for a while, but they've heard the word of the Lord this morning and they're responding right now. At your home right now, if you're a mother and you have felt the convicting word of God preached to your spirit, I challenge you, find a place to pray this morning. Give yourself to God. Pour your heart out. Your family needs you. Your children need you. Your church needs you. And God is calling you today. mothers today that you would be blessed and strengthened we uphold you the rock church is dependent upon you godly mothers i know many of you are carrying a heavy weight many of you have, have had to not only work from home many of you are homeschooling your children this has been a tremendous load and then maybe dad is at work that load of preparing meals washing clothes cleaning house teaching children and I would, I would encourage fathers and sons and daughters, be a strength to your mom. I've got reports from a number of women that are really, really under the pressure of this and it's overwhelming them. Let, let me encourage you, give mom some time off this week. Maybe you could tell her, honey, mom, why don't you take Thursday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and just a couple of hours to yourself. Maybe you need some me time. I understand that women are carrying a heavy load, and if anybody needs relief, your mom does. So we pray strength to her right now. The Rock Church wants to be a comfort to you. I pray the blessing of God upon every one of you today. Go spend quality time with your mom. Mothers, we love you. Don't forget tonight, join us back at 6.30. Evangelist Pastor B.J. Wilmoth will be preaching. We love you. The Rock Church salutes all of our mothers. Happy Mother's Day from the Rock Church. We love you.